seven things that God hates. I shouldn't smile when I say that because it's not something to smile about. You definitely don't want to be in any of these categories. But God does say there are seven things that he hates. The book of Proverbs is all about wisdom versus foolishness. Proverbs 26, 25 says, Speaking of the foolish person who rejects wisdom, when he speaks graciously, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. A person who does not fear God, does not have understanding, does not walk in righteousness, and has no regard for the truth. This person may be pleasant, well-mannered, polite, gracious, and very interesting to talk to, but they are also a fool, according to God, and full of deceit if they are holding abominations in their heart. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 explains what these abominations are seven things that God hates. This section of Proverbs actually says there are six things the Lord hates, but seven are an abomination to him, which is a riddle because two of the seven are actually sort of the same thing. So it makes six things. But here's a list of the seven abominations. Number two and number six are essentially the same, but God has addressed them in two different ways. Number one is a proud look. Number two is a lying tongue. Three, hands that shed innocent blood. Four, heart that devises wicked imaginations. Five, feet that are swift in running to mischief. Six, a false witness that speaks lies. So that very similar to number two, a lying tongue. And seven, he that sows discord among the brethren. So I want to give a biblical explanation of the seven abominations to the Lord. He warns us not to believe people who hate or talk badly about other people and then are nice to us because most likely it'll only be a matter of time before you'll pick up these bad habits. So you want to be very careful in aligning with anybody who is cherishing any of these things. Proverbs 26, 24 to 25 says, Enemies disguise themselves with their lips, but in their hearts they harbor deceit. Though their speech is charming, do not believe them, for seven abominations fill their hearts. So first of all, God hates a proud look. The Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18, it says, those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Daniel 4.37. And again, the Bible says, Behold, I am against you, O most haughty one. Jeremiah 50.31. In almost every instance in the Bible, as well as in life, when pride is, it's associated with failure, not success. And we hear a great deal about an inferiority complex, which is still pride. But the superiority complex of pride is not spoken of as much. Pride is what caused the fall of Lucifer. He became Satan the devil as a result of pride. Pride keeps thousands, thousands of people away from Christ today because people think, what will my friends think? What will my family think? What will happen to my reputation if I become a Christian? Basically, people run their life quality through what will happen if I become born again. Hmm. I don't think I want that reputation of what that will mean for me. Haughty implies lifting or exalting oneself up, pride, arrogance, and being consumed with self. So that's a, the person who just lives for self-gratification. The decisions they make, they don't check them past what would God want me to do. They know God does not want them to do that. Haughtiness is driven by a disdain for others, an attitude of superiority, and a confidence in self-relating to a lack of trust in God. King Nebuchadnezzar was haughty when he was looking over the kingdom, which he claims he had built all by himself, only to have God bring him down to the mind and life of an animal so that he would humble him. And Jesus said, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And the entrance into the kingdom of heaven is gained only through coming in humility. You can actually become sick when people 
come against you with pride. There's oftentimes the impact on people when they're treated with disdain, when the haughty person rises up over them, they themselves have to fight to pray off the spirits that come on them. A simple, proud look can cause so much pain to another person. And many of these people, they don't care how it makes others feel when they walk around with that prideful expression. They sometimes do this intentionally. They enjoy the effect that they're having on others, the way that they feel elevated when they look this certain way. But God does care and he hates it. He hates it, he says. He calls these people foolish. He says they judge others to build themselves up. And God himself is always considerate. He's always loving and he cares about the well-being and the feelings of everyone. And therefore this angers him when people think they're better than someone else. The greatest act of humility in the history of the universe was when Jesus Christ stooped to die on a cross at Calvary. And before anyone can get to heaven, they will kneel at the foot of that cross and acknowledge that they are a sinner, that they have broken the commandments of God, and that they need Jesus to be forgiven and to go to heaven. No one can come proudly to the Savior. No one will come proudly into heaven. Second, the Bible says that God hates a lying tongue. Proverbs 19.22 says, What a person desires is unfailing love, better to be poor than a liar. God hates a lying tongue for two reasons. One, because he doesn't hate the person telling the lie, but he hates the lie that's being told. And two, because lies cause so much pain and suffering, just as much as anything else on the list. And this is not the occasional lie that people may become worried about that a lot of times comes from fear. This is the liar with the habit of lying all the time. You can't trust a liar. They'll tell you whatever you want to hear to get whatever they want from you. They waste your time. They take advantage of your kindness and they're always hiding the truth. And if you forgive them when you catch them and you allow this to repeat, you're going to have to do it at your own expense over and over because they're never going to change without a intervention, a pretty serious intervention and a big boundary. When they're done using you or you can no longer give them what they want, they're going to betray you and then they're going to lie about you. And this causes you pain and it upsets God because he cares about people. Lying may seem like a trivial sin when compared to murder or adultery, but God does not view lying as trivial. He hates it. He's very clear he hates it. Lying makes love impossible, makes truth hard to find, and it makes relationships not work. Lying breaks trust, creates isolation. Lying to gain an advantage or to avoid harm only harms others. And those who are likely to lie are also likely to have other patterns of sin that they must lie to keep hidden. Liars use people, they don't love them. Lying will lead you faster downhill than anything else you can imagine. And the truth, on the other hand, will instantly set you free. Children lie instinctively without even being taught. And the flagrant sins of fraud, embezzlement, slander, libel, and breach of promise are products of a lying heart. Where did this come from? Jesus said, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do in John 8, 44. Human nature was distorted at the fall of Adam, but Jesus Christ, who is the truth, came saying in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Third thing God hates is hands that shed innocent blood. The sixth commandment says, thou shalt not murder in Exodus 20, 13. Interestingly, psychologists tell us that the seed of murder lurks in the heart of the most respected person. I think it's in everyone. I have talked to many people when I was in the jails that were charged with murder and it's pretty shocking how murder happens and it's usually pretty sudden. Most people don't plan them out. It's a sudden act of passion that wasn't really expected. 
Proverbs 1.19 says, Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. God hates it when we don't do what we can to intervene and protect an innocent life. God hates laws that don't protect the innocent and those who cannot defend themselves. God hates those who corrupt themselves so severely that the consequences of their own actions lead to endless suffering of others. God wants people, churches, and nations to live with integrity and to be beacons of hope for others standing in the gap for the innocent. A fool doesn't care for innocent life. He will do whatever it takes for his own convenience and selfish gain. God also hates beating or killing of an innocent person for obvious reasons, and this happens every single hour in families. Consider the suffering it creates in a family and especially children who have to grow up watching one of their parents being beaten or abused by the other, or the children worse being beaten themselves. Without question, God is deeply grieved by this kind of behavior. But the Bible also says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him, 1 John 3, 15. This means heaven is not your future home. Murder can be committed in many ways. You can murder your spouse, your children, your friends, simply by the poison of hatred and bitterness. Not all murderers are behind bars. Only those who kill the body are punished by the law, but there are many who are free who are just as guilty of murder in God's eyes, and they're destroying lives, personalities, and the souls of others. And the Bible says that you can strike someone with your tongue in Jeremiah 18:18. 18, 18. You can ruin people's reputations, and God will hold you accountable for murder. Fourth, Thing that God hates, the Bible says, God hates a heart that devises evil imaginations. Proverbs 15, 26, the Lord detests the thoughts of the wicked, but gracious words are pure in his sight. So you have to ask yourself if you think a lot of negative things, complaining, lustful things, ungrateful, prideful thoughts, God hates this because it goes against his very nature of being generous, kind, gentle, considerate, loving, and merciful. It's all the things he's done for us are not what's in our mind. The entitlement is very, up, it's oppositional to who God is. We are owed nothing. We're owed hell. Anything that we have that isn't hell is a complete blessing. It is one thing to engage in doing evil things, but God hates it when we even think about it, when we're sitting there dwelling on doing evil. He wants our thought lives to be honoring to him, seeking his will, his kingdom, rather than plotting or fantasizing about sinning. We can avoid doing a lot of wrong things if we avoid thinking about all the wrong things to begin with. And I probably sound like a broken record, but again, audio Bibles. I just, that is the way to go with us, is we have even just seven bells with Tatiana creating audio versions of, of prayer and the Bible, but there's free apps on your phone. You can buy little wonder Bibles, but if you want to control your thought life, just keep the Bible playing around you or in your ear because it will really help control your thoughts. When you focus on negative, evil, and wicked things, you oppose what God is doing, and often you help the devil. Not only destroy you, but destroy others as well. If you're imagining wicked things all the time, eventually you will say them and you will do them. People will start to see it because it shows up on you. Shows up in where you go, shows up on things you say, things you watch, how you dress, what kind of people you hang with, all come from the way you think. Instead of building faith in the word of God, you'll build fear and allow the devil to set you up for a fall. You can only hope that that fall will lead you to Jesus because if it doesn't, I still don't know of any sin that's worth eternity in hell. After using you to follow his evil plan, the devil will leave you hopeless, alone, dead, in jail. He has no plans 
for this to come to any good end, but torment for eternity for you. That's why it's better to honor Jesus and consider the goodness of God and fight off all types of wicked, prideful, selfish, and ungrateful thinking. Thought is sown in the mind, but then it's reaped in the actions. The law judges sin according to the act, but God judges us according to the evil in our hearts. Matthew 5.28 says, when, whenever or whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And we're living in a day when men and women are both living in a state of lust. We've seen the statistics. We know how much that's happening. But the Bible said it's in the thoughts. That's where the judgment from God is being made. The Bible said God hates this. No person with an evil imagination can inherit the kingdom of God, which is heaven. God hates evil imaginations. They lead to habits. Habits lead to bondage, and bondage leads to death. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. The fifth thing that God says he hates in the Bible are feet that are swift in running to mischief. Evil thoughts and imagination, if nourished and fed, will lead to sinful actions. So people who are, um, especially in the area of sexual immorality, that are just dwelling on these things mentally, will end up doing it. There are people in every community who openly and boastfully violate God's law. They brag that they are not hypocrites, and they make no illusion of being good. They are assuming on a grace that just mocks the cross of Christ. Grace was very expensive. It cost Jesus everything. It should never be taken cheaply. This does not excuse anyone for their wickedness. Proverbs 7.22 says, All at once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose. This is... An example of a cheating woman that seduces a man, and in the verse, he doesn't make any effort at all to resist her. He falls into the trap and pays a huge price for his actions. Feet that are swift to run into mischief are people who practice mischievous activities and can't turn down the opportunity when it comes up again because they're just so used to doing it. It presents itself, they do it again. It presents itself, they do it again. It is the opposite of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Do not be fooled. You can call yourself a Christian all day long. In reality, you are not one. And everyone knows it. God hates this because the person doesn't have enough faith in him, in God himself, to stop and consider the pain they will cause, tripping others also, leading others into disobedience. There's a huge price for that. But they only consider the pleasure they will gain, and they do not consider the price that they will pay and the accountability later for all of those that they swept up in their disobedience. All three people involved will suffer damage as a result of this, and hopefully not for eternity. As believers, we have the option in Christ to choose the way of escape that he provides so that we need not give in to sin. He does promise a way of escape. We need to be with those who fight the devil and resist him by faith. The fool runs to evil with each and every opportunity given to them. Careless choices, very careless choices. They just always think they can turn it around. They don't stop. They do not think about the consequences or about what this does to God or those who he's trying to draw into the kingdom. We need to be like God, hating evil, rather than running fast to do it. Sixth, and very similar to two, a false witness that speaks lies. Proverbs 14.5, an honest witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. A false witness will tell lies about other people and then will also blame things on others. God already said that he hates lying in number two, and a lifestyle that spurns the truth and it's totally untrustworthy is what he hates. He hates those who say false things about other people, and we need to be those who testify to what is true about God, his word, and about others. False witnesses who wrongly defame the reputation of others 
are considered a great evil in God's sight. False witnesses who defame the reputation of others are a great evil in God's sight. We need to be careful who we endorse. We need to be careful who we are standing behind because our witness, if we are standing behind someone we endorse who is guilty of any of these things, supports their sin and God does not approve. We need to be very careful who we endorse. At any level of life, we need to be very careful who we stand behind. Seventh, the Bible says that God hates a man or woman who sows discord among the brethren. Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. An instigator is a person who causes two or more people to dislike or hate each other, maybe even to the point of someone getting seriously hurt, at times even killed. Proverbs uses the word tale bearer, a person who cause, tells other people secrets to simply cause trouble. A gossiper or whisperer is a person with a mouth of disobedience and their tongue is very busy. A troublemaker who does it for their own entertainment. Hatred and division can develop in both families, in the family of God and in your personal family, when just one person decides to make life miserable for the others. You can spread strife by picking fights, lying, tempting others, teasing, just by being difficult, by having a bad attitude. One person just giving silent treatment to the whole house can ruin the atmosphere. Some people prefer contention and combat rather than peace and harmony. And God's will for his body of believers, the church, is peace as much as it depends on us. Romans 12, 18. The fool could care less about peace, creating interference and interruption for the work of God. And that's exactly what it does. If you're not working for peace within the body, you're creating interference and interruption for God himself. And God hates this type of attitude and action because of how seriously destructive and distracting it is. We seldom hear the slanderer, the libeler, or the malicious gossip denounced. We've come to think it's somehow harmless to sow discord in the office, the shop, the church, the home. Social media is just a nest of discord. But the Bible says God hates discord and strongly denounces those who sow strife. Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And the Bible says, If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, deceives his own heart, and his religion is useless. James 1.26 As children of God, there should be decreasing evidence of foolishness about us. We should be growing and progressing as the Holy Spirit gets rid of foolish habits, thoughts, attitudes, and actions. As Proverbs 4.18 says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. That is what God loves. So what can we do about these dreadful traits that are in our hearts because they're far too prevalent and very little is said about them. There is little that we can do as people, but there is a lot that God has done and will do. And this secret is found in the words of the Apostle Paul, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, which is required to go to heaven, you can make your tongue so that it will speak only good. Jesus will come into your heart, your whole life actually, transform you, change your nature until you love instead of hate. What you will hate is sin. You will hate gossip, slander, maligning. You will hate them. You will not find pleasure in sin at all. Jesus, through his triumphant death on the cross, brought us, bought us a completely new way to live. 
He said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come that they might have life. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And to be cleansed from sin, there's nothing like it. I was one who was cleansed from sin. I could have grown a limb and it wouldn't have been as big of a deal as to feel cleansed from my sin. It worked for me and I had a lot of sin and it will work for you. I have seen too many transformations to count and I live to see many, many more. I honestly live to see others transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing like it. When a person is born again, really, there is nothing like it. Don't settle for anything less. If you're guilty of any of the things I have mentioned, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. No matter how guilty you may be, you may have broken all the commandments. God can forgive you today because Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of your sins. He took the weight of all of our sins on himself, all of them. And if you think that yours are too much, you're saying that the cross was not enough for your sin, and I guarantee you that it was. God hates the evil of our heart, but he loves us. Just as a parent despises the bad behavior of their child, they love their child. God hates the forces that would cause us to end up in hell, but he loves us with an eternal love, and he will be trying until the last moment to try to get us to turn from our sin. But the matter of salvation is not forced on anyone. It is a gift and it must be received. You have to accept it. And there is a promise on which you can put your whole trust. John 1, 12, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe on his name. Until you do that, you are not a child of God. God is not the father of everyone. People say we are all children of God, but we are not all children of God. At the moment that you receive Jesus Christ and you become a follower of Jesus Christ and no longer a follower of your own thoughts, you are a child of God. He will forgive every single sin that you have ever committed. He will give you strength and power over all the temptations of your life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the power that resurrected Jesus from the dead, God says is available to us if we ask. There is no sin that is greater than that power. It split the earth. First, we must renounce our sins. We have to confess them and we also have to allow God our entire life. This isn't something that's done by saying, I will quit all these things but this one thing. Oftentimes with people I deal with, it is, I don't want this addiction anymore, I don't want this torment anymore, but I'm certainly not going to leave the relationship that I'm sexually sinning in. I will not do that. I'm going to try to make that work. The thing is, is God doesn't accept that. It's either all or nothing with him. And I would say, rather than leading that person to hell, you should absolutely turn and run from that so that both of you could be saved. You can be saved. You can be saved at this moment, actually, from all of the things, not just what I mentioned, but everything. God will radically change your life. When Jesus is given the throne, there is an instant change in your life, starting with peace. That is my passion. By, by first calling, I'm an evangelist. I desire to lead people into the kingdom of God. That is my first passion. I also love to help people break off the things that are keeping them tethered to the enemy, but that is a far second compared to bringing people into the kingdom. So if you ever 
want to discuss Jesus Christ and be born again, never hesitate to reach out to me because that is what I live for. My salvation was such an amazing gift. It was 30 years ago, but I still marvel today like I did that day. I do not deserve to be saved. I did not deserve Jesus. I was so sinful. I marvel to this very day that God chose to step out and save a wretch like me. And since that time, I do the best I can to let others see that Jesus is as amazing as I can find words for. He is far more amazing. I would not trade this life for anything. He has never failed me. He has never done me wrong. I have done him wrong many times, but he has never done me wrong. He is seriously way too good for words. And I would rather die than lose him. I would rather die. I don't want to ever live any part of my life without him. It is so rich in experience. Precious Lord, you are precious. You are so precious. And for anyone who their self stands in the way of them being able to see what a total honor, privilege, what a tremendous privilege to be offered salvation by you, sonship, being a daughter of the Most High God. What a tremendous privilege and offer. Why would we not do it? What in this world could possibly keep us from that? I pray that you deal with everyone, including me, that we would never hold something more dear to us than worshiping the true King and bringing as many people with us into that worship as possible. May that be our only focus, our only mission, is to exalt you, Jesus, on this earth as it grows darker and darker. May we be the bright, bright candles on a hill that you've asked us to be. Let us not walk so closely with the world in sin that they can't tell that we even know Jesus. Help us, God, to rise up and to be a flaming candle for you. Thank you for saving me. I am one who knows I should be in hell. Every day I know what I deserved. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for allowing me the privilege of being able to speak for you, to say your name this side of heaven, that when I see you face to face, I'm going to be overwhelmed, so overwhelmed, to meet the King, the one who died for me. Holy Spirit, we loose you through all of those who are hearing do your greatest possible work in each one and cause everyone to despise their sin, to throw it down and run to the cross. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.